welcome to Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. I served as president of the San Antonio chapter in 2009-10. I'm currently on the executive board of the Texas Society of CPAs and have chaired some committees at that level and the local level. and and participated in many committees. And it really helped me build my leadership skills, communication skills, speaking skills. All of that, I think, has helped me be a better controller and associate vice president at the university. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. That clip was from Edie Cogdall, our guest for this episode. Edie is the Associate Vice President for Business and Finance and Comptroller for a private university in San Antonio, Texas, the University of the Incarnate Word. I invited Edie on the show for many reasons, and I'm really glad she accepted because I like to make sure we're highlighting all the different career opportunities that exist in accounting. And she has a very interesting role in industry, something we don't always think about. And at the same time, it's a very rewarding and challenging position. Plus, as you're going to hear in the interview, Edie is extremely, and I mean extremely, involved serving the profession through the State CPA Society. And she attributes much of her personal development over the years to these volunteer leadership positions. I really enjoy recording the episode, and I hope you get a lot of insight out of it as well. Please remember to visit our website at whereaccountantsgo.com for notes on this episode and, of course, every other episode we've recorded over the last year and a half. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Here's Edie Cogdell, Associate VP for Business and Finance and Comptroller with University of the Incarnate Work. Well, hello, Edie. Thank you so much for taking the time to record this. Uh, the listeners wouldn't know this, but you and I have busy schedules, and so I'm just glad we were able to to get an appointment that worked out for both of us. Thank you very much. Sure. Happy to be here, and you finally tracked me down. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, for the audience, Edie Cogdell is on the line, and she's the Associate Vice President for Business and Finance and Comptroller for the University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio, which is a very prestigious private university. I've gotten to know Edie over the years through our involvement in the CPA Society, actually. And I always like to make sure we're highlighting a variety of career paths. So Edie is actually someone I've been trying to get on the show for a few months now because of her unique background. Edie, I definitely want to get into your current role and and all the volunteer efforts, actually, that you put into the profession, but I always like to start at the beginning so our guests really get a better idea of of who you are, so to speak, and and how you got to where you are. What initially influenced you to even consider accounting as a career in the first place? Well, it was actually my first accounting professor at Baylor University. I had started out there majoring in finance and I really enjoyed my first accounting class that was part of the core business curriculum and talked a lot to that professor, and he was a great mentor and role model, and he's the one that convinced me to pursue accounting. So I ended up double majoring, and I got a degree in finance and accounting. Interesting. Okay. I'm curious, was there an initial influence that got you into finance in the first place? Did you always... I actually wanted to go to law school. Oh. Oh, So that was a totally different turn of events, but glad it ended up the way that it did. I I don't think I would have enjoyed being a lawyer, so things happen for a reason. Okay. It sounds like that choice to become an accounting major happened fairly early in your college career. Did you end up having to make up a lot of courses, or were you able to get through in a sort of a, a normal period of time? No, actually, I was a glutton for punishment, and I finished in three years. Oh, Oh I was engaged and we got married two weeks after I graduated. So I had an agenda and went to summer school and took heavy loads and made it through. Wow. Three years. <laughs> well, congratulations. Yeah. Thank I you. I had no idea. <laughs> so what was your first job out of school? 
actually, I went to work for Arthur Anderson in Houston as an auditor. I had done mock interviews at Baylor. They offered that for the accounting students. And I just happened to interview with a manager from Arthur Anderson when I was a junior. And he asked me to come during the summer and be an interviewee for them to train their new managers on interviewing. And so I went and did that over the summer and they actually made me a job offer while I was there. So I had a job offer before I finished up at Baylor. That is interesting. So they they were training their people by interviewing you. So you got interviewed and interviewed and interviewed and interviewed over and over again. Yes. Okay. (laughs) Which was a good experience for me and worked out to into a job offer. So it was perfect. That is amazing. Did you have a particular specialty at Anderson in the audit area? Were you tied to a team or No, I worked on a little bit of everything. I did. It's honestly been too many years. That was back in 1989. So I don't remember all of the clients I worked on, but nothing in particular that I settled into. I really got more in the nonprofit and governmental track later on in my career. Okay. Okay. How long were you at Anderson? Only a year. My husband was working for the state of Texas at the time, and he ended up relocating several times throughout my career. So we've lived all over Texas. I started out in Houston with Anderson. We went to Amarillo, and I worked for a local firm there, Dozier Pickens and Francis. And that's really where I started getting more into the nonprofit, nonprofit and governmental type audits. But that was actually some of the best experience I got as an accountant. When we moved there, I still needed a job. I was looking for a job, and I actually took a job filling in for a bookkeeper in that firm that was out on maternity leave, which I was overqualified for, but needed you know, a paycheck. And so that worked out that when I, you know, I filled in temporarily, but when she came back, they had an audit position open. So I was able to transition into a full-time auditor position there, but it was a smaller firm. So I still kept some bookkeeping clients while I was filling in for her temporarily. I did payroll tax returns, sales tax returns. We did tax returns, you know, regular tax returns for our audit clients, those kinds of things. So I got very well-rounded experience, which helped me a lot for my current position as a comptroller and associate VP of business and finance. Okay. Wonderful. Just overall, I'm curious, how long did you work in public? I was in public for about 10 years. After we left Amarillo, I worked in Fort Worth for a couple of local firms. Then we came to the San Antonio area, and I worked for KPMG, and the university was actually one of my audit clients. I had done the audit for three years, and then that opened up an opportunity to apply for the comptroller's position when it became open. Okay. I didn't realize you started as comptroller at KPMG. Interesting. No, not at KPMG. Oh, at, sorry, not at KPMG. Uh, yeah, at the university. Yes, yeah, I've been in the same position for 18 years. Wow. 18 years, that's a long time. I didn't also realize that you've been at the university that long. Time flies. <laughs> it does. <laughs> what have you enjoyed the most about all that time at, at UIW? It's a wonderful community, great group of people to work with. I really love my job most days. Keeps you challenged on your toes. We've grown rapidly over the years. I think our operating budget has quadrupled in the time that I was here. We're educating students, which I'm passionate about. And so that's been fun working among students. We actually have students that work in our office, accounting students, you know, that can get experience doing an internship before they graduate. And so it's just been a great environment to work in. That had to be, I would think, a, a major adjustment to go from public accounting, particularly a national firm, even though it's you know the San Antonio office, but a national firm, to a private university. <laughs> it was quite a culture shock, yes. Yeah. It, it took me about a year, I think, to get over the culture shock and really get settled into my new position, although it was a much easier transition since I had been the auditor. For three years prior, I knew a lot of the people that I was working with already and knew a lot about the business. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I I would expect just a major culture shock, like (laughs) like you mentioned, but if you know the people, then then that's a lot different. Well, what would you say, I guess, is sort of unique about working at a private university in your role? What's, What's different than some of the other commercial positions that we accounts might take? Well, fund accounting for sure is very different, which you learn in school, but until you do it, it's a very different structure than a normal corporate set of books. So that took a long time to kind of learn and get our arms around. The financial reporting is extensive. We actually manage 
I work for the university, but we have six entities that we consolidate in our financial statements and one that's not consolidated. We manage St. Anthony's Catholic High School, Incarnate Word High School, Incarnate Word Education Foundation, which is a second entity involved in some new market tax credit transactions that we have to help fund some of our projects. And also we have a school in Mexico, actually two schools in Mexico. One is consolidated, one's in Mexico City, and one is in Irapuato, Mexico. And then we have an entity called TIGMER, Texas Institute for Graduate Medical Education and Research, which is a separate entity we needed to create to do the residency piece related to a new medical school that we started this year. Hmm. Oh my gosh, that, that is a much more complex organization, I realized. And becoming more complex every day, it seems like, but that keeps me on my toes and that's part of what makes my job so fun. Sure. Yeah, that gives you a whole lot more variety. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'm curious, you mentioned the fund accounting piece being different. Was that a little bit of a surprise when you transitioned from public accounting? Because I'm sure having audited the organization for a few years, you you felt like you had a pretty good handle on the organization, but sometimes it's different when you get inside. (laughs) It is very different, yes. When you're the auditor, you see things at a much higher level. You only learn, you only get answers to the questions you ask, so you don't necessarily learn everything about an entity. So I still had quite a bit to learn when I transitioned over as comptroller, but I was familiar with the fund accounting quite a bit in that type of reporting. I tended to specialize in governmental and nonprofit, as I mentioned, after kind of after I left Arthur Anderson, but with the local firms that I worked on and then KPMG, I tended to specialize in that area. So I was very familiar with fund accounting from that perspective. How did you get up to speed or or deepen your knowledge of fund accounting once you came on board full time? On the job training, you just figure it out. It's it's kind of sink or swim. So you just get in. I had people that had worked here for a long time that I learned from. My boss has been here longer than me. So he was very knowledgeable and he was one of my mentors when I got here and still is. So you just kind of figure it out as you go. But I felt like I had a well-rounded background, number one, from having audited the university, but just from public accounting in general, and especially the work that I did when I filled in temporarily for that bookkeeper in Amarillo when I worked for that local firm. And so I felt like I had a good base of knowledge to kind of hit the ground running. And then I've just continued to learn over the years. When you were in public accounting with KPMG right before the transition, what level were you at? Audit manager. manager. Audit manager? Okay. Yes. Okay. Did you find moving into the comptroller role that the management or supervision and management responsibilities were a little different? Absolutely. I'm managing a much larger staff, and it definitely, as a manager in industry, is a large demand on your time, just managing the personnel and all the issues that come with that. The accounting piece of my job is is easy. It's, you know, sometimes it's the people stuff that's more difficult. Okay. What have you done over the years to develop those skills? Actually, getting involved in the Texas Society of CPAs and the San Antonio Society of CPAs. I served as president of the San Antonio chapter in 2009-10. I'm currently on the executive board of the Texas Society of CPAs and have chaired some committees at that level and the local level and and participated in many committees. And it really helped me build my leadership skills, communication skills, speaking skills. All of that, I think, has helped me be a better controller and associate vice president at the university. Okay. You know, we talk about that a lot, so much that it becomes cliche a little bit that you can develop your leadership skills through organizations. But it sounds like what you're saying is through the leadership of volunteers or leading volunteers towards a common goal, that it really does make a difference in your daily job. Is that is that where you think that comes from? Yes, I, I really agree with that. I think it does make you a better leader in your job when you're leading and involved in a volunteer capacity. That can be a challenge, too. I know the year I was president in San Antonio, I had a board member that we had some difficulties with, and dealing with that situation really helped me build those skills of dealing with difficult situations or confrontation, and that's something that you don't even expect in a volunteer capacity, but sometimes those tough experiences are what helps you learn the most. Uh, Just for the record, between you and I and everyone who's listening, I was not on the board at that time. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's very true, Mark. It was not you. I had to think about, oh, shoot, was it me? <laughs> <laughs> no. 
<laughs> wonderful, wonderful. You know, was that the original reason that you started getting involved with the society, or is that just one of the benefits that you realized along the way? Or yeah, No, how, I think how that's you... one of the benefits I learned along the way. When I started out being involved in the society, I wasn't expecting to become president. It just kind of happened over time, but I just felt strongly... Well, let me back up. First of all, I would say when I started in public accounting, it was very common in public accounting firms, and especially the big four now back then it was the big eight, that everybody becomes a member of the Texas Society of CPAs and the AICPA. And so I just automatically became a member once I joined the firm and have maintained that membership the whole time. And when I was in Fort Worth, I actually got involved in the Fort Worth chapter first and enjoyed my experience there. So when we moved to San Antonio, I sought out getting involved in the San Antonio chapter. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I was curious if that was the purpose behind getting involved initially or... No, it's more kind of giving back to the profession. I feel like I've gotten a lot out of my experience over the years in my career, and I want to help give back to the profession and make sure I'm serving any way I can. Okay. I hate to use the term devil's advocate, but looking at the the potential objections people have, and what, what would you say to somebody that says, you know, I just don't have the time because that's sort of a a typical argument, you know, that people have. It is. Yeah. And I would say, first of all, you get out of it what you put into it. So if you don't ever get involved or spend any time volunteering, then that piece of your life may be lacking. I think that helps you make helps make you more well-rounded and is a rewarding experience. And there's many ways to get involved that don't take a lot of time. And there's opportunities during the day, during the week, in the evenings, on weekends. So whatever fits your schedule. I know a lot of people have families and, you know, lots of activities outside of work. And that's just something that you make time for, just like anything else. Okay. I feel like it's a priority issue, exactly. And and I was curious how you would look at that. You know, there's a lot of ways to be involved, like you just said. What, what do you feel, <laughs> I guess, has, has driven you to become ultra-involved? I mean, you can be involved, but then you've been president of the local chapter and you're on the executive board. That that goes beyond, beyond just being an involved member. <laughs> it does, yeah. I would say I think just my experience over time, I really enjoyed what I was doing. I enjoyed the people I was working with, and it was fulfilling, you know, and rewarding experience. And so I just wanted to keep doing it. And so over time, it just transitioned into a role on the board and then eventually leadership positions. And so it just kind of seemed like a natural progression for me. There was actually a year, though, my husband was working overseas and we had kids that were in school that had lots of activities. And I was actually supposed to be president a year before. And I stepped back and said, there's no way I can do that this year. So we switched and the person that was supposed to be president after me went the year before me. So I think that's also something. I think they're very flexible in understanding of life and family commitments, and they understand if you have to pull back or take a break. We are volunteers, and we have family responsibilities and work responsibilities that sometimes come first or conflict. Hmm. Yeah, I, I experienced the same thing. There, there really is some flexibility, even if you commit to something that's going to be potentially several years, you know, in advance, maybe you're in line to do something. There really is some flexibility with the organizations. And yes. Yeah, you know, if you need to switch back and forth, that's that's definitely possible. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say the the people and basically the people that are involved because as of the time of recording this, I just completed Texas State Society's survey that they sent out and, and I found myself answering those questions in that way as well. And it, it's hard to quantify, but I think people get involved because of leadership or because their employer asks them to or expects them to, but what keeps them involved is the people that they're hanging around are just genuinely good people and, and frankly, some of the smartest people in the profession. And it's hard to quantify that. That's very well said, though, and I agree. It's Yes, there's an expectation usually that gets you involved in the first place, but you have to be engaged and enjoying what you're doing to stay in it for the long term. Hmm. Yeah, we need to work on how to quantify that or, or yeah. how to 
verbalize it well as a system. We're actually working on that at the state level with our strategic planning that we're doing. They're looking at how to quantify member satisfaction, member engagement, those kinds of things, because that is important for us to understand to make sure that we are serving our members well and that they're getting value for the dues that they're paying. And it's much easier to retain a member than to lose one and recruit a new one yes. to replace them, just like in a job. So it's important that we understand our members and their needs, and that's why you got a survey to answer. We're just trying to always do a better job of understanding our members and what their needs are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing how many business principles are just universal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but getting back to your career a little bit, the position you have at that level is something that a lot of students dream of. They're thinking they're either going to go through public accounting and become partner or through industry and maybe maybe start in public, maybe not, but through industry and, and get into a controller or CFO level eventually. That's, that's a lot of people's goals. What advice would you have for someone that is actually, I guess, it's wanting to prepare themselves for those moves like you did when you moved out of public accounting into into industry and into this role any any preparation advice that you can think of I do I would say first of all if you are interested in pursuing the CPA which I strongly recommend to everybody it does set you apart and makes you a much better employee leader it just sets you apart and makes you more marketable, gives you much more career opportunities. And so I would definitely say pursue the CPA certificate. And if you are going to do that, do that as soon as you, as soon as you can. The longer you wait, life tends to get in the way. It's harder to go back and study. And especially if it's parts of the exam that you don't work in, then you kind of lose what you learned in school a little bit. So I think that's the best advice I can give anybody. I, back when I took the exam, you could still take it before you graduated. So my last semester at Baylor, I was studying for the CPA exam and all my accounting finals at the same time, which was wonderful. And I could take a review class from one of the professors at Baylor. So it made it much easier to get through the exam. Also, I personally liked doing the public accounting route first and then transitioning into industry, although there's any way to go about that. Uh, When I started in public accounting, I thought I wanted to be a partner and never dreamed I'd be in industry. And this position just kind of fell into my lap. So I thought it was a great transition for me, but I wouldn't trade the public accounting experience that I got. I think it helps make me a better controller. And it also helps me work with our auditors. I understand what they're looking for and what they need and what their challenges are. So it makes our audit go more smoothly than it could if I didn't have that experience. Mm, okay. You know, while we're on that note, as a comptroller in industry, is there any message you want to send to the auditors out there in the world? It's a joke. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking be nice to your clients, but it's funny how auditors get a bad rap. You know, everybody's scared of the auditors if they don't understand what they're really doing, but they're actually a very wonderful group of people and they're there to help you. So it's funny how sometimes it doesn't appear to be that way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I just caught this uh, for anybody that didn't. So Edie went through school in three years. You took a review course and you studied for the exam while you were still in school. All, yes. all of that in the three-year period. Yes. Oh my gosh. Wow. wow. Uh, like I said, glutton for punishment. I would, I would never do that again, but <laughs> at the time it seemed to make sense. And I wouldn't be where I am today if I hadn't done it that way. So that's very true. That's very true. Yeah, I'm curious. I added this to the list of questions because I thought it'd be very appropriate with you. And one of our actually listeners and previous guests suggested it, as well as things that went. If you could go back in time, though, and give your younger self one piece of advice, what might that be? I think it would be to finish all my schooling while I'm young and before I start a family and a career. I actually went back and did my master's degree since I've been at the university. And at that time, I had young children, and it was just much tougher to get through that program at that point in my life than if I had done it straight out of my bachelor's degree. Although if you're sitting for the CPA exam nowadays, it's pretty much a requirement to get a master's degree, the five-year program to have enough hours to sit for the exam. So that may not be as big an issue these days as it was back when I graduated. It wasn't that common to get a master's degree to be a CPA. 
Hmm. Yeah, I'm curious. That that is interesting. I didn't know that that you got a master's later on. What what benefit have you seen from that, either from a career standpoint or you know, has it made your job easier over time? I think it did it did make me a better manager and leader just from some of the experience in that program. I didn't get a master's in accounting. We didn't offer it at the time, so it's actually an MBA, but I think that makes me a better Comptroller and Associate VP, I think it makes me just that much stronger in my capabilities. I remember one of our professors in that program said we're 10% or only 10% of the people go on to get a master's. So that also sets you apart. Now, I didn't need it for my current position because I was already here. That was more just for my personal benefit. And honestly, it was a benefit that they offered to our employees, so I didn't have to pay for it. So a huge benefit that I wanted to take advantage of while I was here. Oh, that's right. That's right. Now, see, now that we mentioned that on air, you're, you're going to be flooded with a, a few extra applicants. applicants. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we don't have any vacancies right now, but it's, it, it is a wonderful benefit working here. Actually, I have two daughters that are graduating this May, and we also get free tuition for our dependents. So that was like getting a huge raise since they're wow. both in school at the same time. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, wow. Oh, and congratulations, too. They're getting out of college. That's Thank wonderful. <laughs> As one of my friends would say, off the payroll soon. So. Exactly. <laughs> wonderful. Well, before we get to the, the final questions, you mentioned something about other involvement outside of just the, the board involvement with societies. What, what other nonprofits are you involved in or, or what other programs have you been involved with from a charitable standpoint? I actually serve on the board of Por Vida Academy, which is a charter school that operates high school campuses in San Antonio and Corpus Christi. Two of the campuses serve at-risk students, and the other campus is a college prep. And I've been involved in that organization since I was at KPMG. One of the partners there knew the sister that operated that school before it became a charter and got me connected with them because of my experience with auditing schools and nonprofits, and I've just been involved ever since. I love the organization. I think they have a wonderful mission, and as you can tell, I work at a university, too. We, I'm just very passionate about education and helping students. Yes, and, and that is that K through 12? or No, it's only high school. Only high school, okay. We've talked about elementary or middle, but we haven't gone there yet. Okay, I'm sorry. I missed that part. Okay, wonderful. Anything else you'd like to highlight? No, that's really been between that and the Texas Society of CPAs and the San Antonio chapter. That keeps me pretty busy. Yeah, the the local chapter has a lot of events, Fun Olympics and golf tournaments. It does. Yeah, there is a lot. There is a charitable component to what we do with the San Antonio chapter as well. We have the Blue Santa Luncheon that we just had a few months ago that supports the SAPD's program that provides gifts to needy children. I know you've been integral in growing that to to where it is today, and that's a wonderful event that helps a lot of children in need. Also, the Fun Olympics that helps underserved children have a just fun outing during the summer and provide school supplies. So there's many ways to give back to the community, even through the professional organizations. Wonderful. We're going to put notes to, or links to that rather in the, in the notes on the website that go with oh, great. the podcast. So yeah, yeah, that way people can access it just that much easier. Well, I end every podcast with the same three questions because I, I like to have some consistency across the episodes. And it's interesting, the variety of answers we get. The first one is usually the easiest. What has been your proudest moment? Well, I would say personally, it's been my daughters, you know, the days they're born and just seeing them grow into the fine young ladies they've become. For my career, I would say probably this position, the president of the university at the time actually approached me about becoming the controller. They had the position open at the time and I had had some findings in a management letter that when I was the auditor that I had to come back and he said, well, if you can find these problems, then you can come fix them. So I actually wasn't looking to leave public accounting at the time. But when they approached me, I thought, you know, I I can see myself making that switch. I think it would be a good change. And by then, 10 years into public accounting, I didn't see myself becoming a partner. Back then, you 
tended to have to relocate if you wanted to promote to partner. And we were in a point in our lives when we didn't want to relocate anymore. And so it just seemed like a good change. And then actually getting promoted now to the Associate VP of Business and Finance and Comptroller, that was basically because of my hard work and in a way to recognize all of my achievements and accomplishments. They changed my title and promoted me to that additional level of responsibility. So my goal is to become the VP someday. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I just have to ask now, are either of your daughters accounting majors? No, they are not. (laughs) One is a nursing student and one is majoring in biology and is going to go to medical school. So at least I will be taken care of in my old age. Uh, There you go. There you go. No, they've been to my office enough that they said they didn't want to do this. They'll they'll care for you emotionally and and maybe literally as well as that's right. Medical students. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, I, I hear there's a future in medicine, so that's that's a there is great. yes. So hopefully the one daughter will end up at our medical school that we just started, but we'll see. There you go. Well, tell us about a mistake you've made and what you learned from it, of course. And frankly, the bigger the better. We like the big mistakes. Well, one that comes to mind is we had implemented a new student fee here at the university that the students actually voted for. It was a self-imposed fee and went through the all the extensive process that it had to go through to be approved by the student government association and the student body. And, and so it was very well known that this was coming and we knew it was coming. Well, we ended up not getting it on the student bills the first semester, and that was just an oversight. We had talked about it early on, and then I didn't follow through and make sure that we had everything in place to get it charged to the students, and that was about a $200,000 mistake. The university ended up covering it and transferring the money to the fund that was going to be earmarked for the students to determine how it was going to be spent, and that was a tough lesson to learn that I, you know, that follow through, it just slipped through the cracks. And by the time we found it, it was too late to charge the students. And so I had to eat crow and tell my boss what happened. And the executives decided that we wanted to go ahead and cover it to not have a PR issue with the students. And so that cost us a lot of money. Wow. I can just imagine what it must have been like when you realized what had happened. Yeah, that was a very bad feeling. I had my heart sank and had a pit my stomach and it was just like, oh, I can't believe this happened. And by then it's too late. It is what it is and you just have to deal with it. So there's no point hiding it or pretending like, oops, I didn't know we were supposed to charge that this semester. So you just suck it up and take the lumps and move on. Wow. But I learned from it. We certainly follow through now if there's something new like that. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, definitely. Well, sometimes the, the hardest lessons are, are the ones that are most valuable. So, Agreed. Um, wow. Wow. Any advice for someone that, excuse the, the term, but has, someone that realizes they've made a mistake that has that much of an effect? Any thoughts on how you handled it that worked well or, or anything you wish you would have done differently? No, actually, I think you just be honest and admit you made a mistake and accept the consequences and accept responsibility for what happened. There's no point in blaming anybody else. I wasn't the one directly responsible for getting it on the bill, but I supervised that area and that's on me. So there's no point in blaming anybody else. It is what it is. You can't change it. You can just make sure you prevent it from happening again. And it's better to be honest and deal with it right away than try to bury it or ignore it. Sure. Yeah, actually, that's one of the themes that's come out across several of the episodes is that, you know, first of all, mistakes happen. It's just part of being human, you know. It is part of life. That's right. That's right. And and the important thing is to just be honest about it and and address it and take your lumps, so to speak, if you have to, but but move forward and figure out, you know, how to to make sure it doesn't happen again. That that came out with Bobby Rios on an early episode we did. He's a CFO here in town as well. And it's come out, I bet on at least one out of every four or five episodes we've done. It's, it's a very common theme. Very wow. Common. Yeah. yeah. Uh, nobody's perfect. That's, That's just right. the way it is. And if you expect to be perfect, then you're going to disappoint yourself. Yeah. That's a sure way to unhappiness. That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, last question. What is the best advice that you personally have ever received? And then we'll go ahead and close it down. I would say it's to pursue my CPA. I don't regret the path I've chosen and taken and 
I would do it again in a heartbeat. And so I think that was really what got me started on the path that I'm on today. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. It's made a big difference in my life and my career overall. And, and I think that we can never hear that too much. So. <laughs> right. And it does make you stand apart and it does make you a stronger professional. There is a difference between an accountant that doesn't have a CPA and an accountant that does. And many career opportunities require a CPA. My position requires the CPA. So you can only go so far in your career without it many times. That makes a lot of sense. It really does. Well, Edie, thank you so much again for for sharing all your time with us. I know your time is valuable, and so I, I really do appreciate you taking the time for this. No, I'm happy to help. It's been a great experience. This was actually my first podcast, so I enjoyed oh, it. Well, welcome. Welcome to the podcast world. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> there you go. Well, for the audience, this has been another episode of Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. If you haven't yet visited the home website, please do so. You can find the notes and links we mentioned to this episode on the website, as well as, of course, all the show notes for all the episodes we've done over the last year and a half. That website is www.whereaccountantsgo.com. And Edie was mentioning the CPA certificate. I have to mention this as well. We've recently become affiliates for several of the CPA review courses. So if you have an interest in pursuing your CPA exam, please check our website as well at whereaccountantsgo.com. And you can find links to all the different options for review courses there also. On that note, Edie, do you have any final thoughts or words of wisdom you'd like to leave with the listeners? One other thing I would mention is as students, they can also join the Texas Society of CPAs and the San Antonio chapter, and I would strongly recommend that. That's just another resource you have and a way to network and learn more about the profession and career opportunities and build your skills, and I just think that's a wonderful way to get involved and learn as much as you can about the profession and start giving back and getting that experience. That's very well said. Yes, getting involved is extremely important, definitely. It is. You know, employers see a lot of resumes, and they look for things that set you apart from others. Everybody that has an accounting degree, the technical skills are pretty well the same, so it's the other skills that employers are looking for, and so that's just one other way that you can set yourself apart. So true. Well, thank you again to the audience for joining us. We will see everybody next week. There's more to come.